Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton, and this is my 57th weekly economic outlook since the pandemic disrupted all our lives. There's lots to talk about. Uh, in particular, um, I think it's uh, looking to be a very busy week here in the UK. Um, perhaps one that might actually presage the breakup of the United Kingdom itself. I am assuming that Thursday's elections will show Boris Johnson's appeal in the so-called red wall seats uh, to have fallen, but to have fallen fairly sharply, but not enough to invalidate the strategy that uh, was put in place by the, the much missed Dominic Cummings. Uh, but the more important story, I think, will be what happens north of the border. Despite being a disaster, both as First Minister and I think as SNP party leader, and despite Scotland under her leadership having taken on many of the attributes of a central European autocracy or even kleptocracy, Nicola Sturgeon has undoubtedly moved Scotland a little bit closer to independence. And I remain stunned at how little anyone south of the border has done to counter the breakup of the union and how ignorant people are about it. I asked, for instance, I asked a very senior Scottish economist for his thoughts on this, and he too seemed to think that the European Union would welcome an independent Scotland into its fold from day one with open arms. Think again, Mac. The problem is that the breakup of the European Union is of the United Kingdom is potentially contagious. This is also the 100th anniversary of the establishment of Northern Ireland and Arlene Foster's disappearance from the scene makes reunification with the Republic a lot more thinkable. Five years from now, what are the odds that the United Kingdom, as we know it, will be broadly as it is today? I don't want to underestimate the power of inertia, and I'm well aware that the details of an independent Scotland are daunting, much more daunting than the, dis the disappearance of Northern Ireland into the Republic would be. But I think 50-50 is about the best odds that I would give on this. For this, as for almost everything that's crazy and scary about Britain today, I'm inclined to blame, blame David Cameron, who may well turn out to have been the worst British Prime Minister since, what, since Jim Callaghan and perhaps the Prime Minister with the worst judgment since Neville Chamberlain. Little wonder, given his record in office and the mistakes that he made, that he saw nothing wrong in becoming a page shill for Lex Greensill. Where do we breed these people? But that's in the future. Uh, let's look at what's been happening over the last week or so. I think the first thing to say is that there's a major disconnect over COVID. On the one hand, as the World Health Organization pointed out, the global pandemic is actually at its height with the number of cases having risen now for nine straight weeks. Obviously, the focus is on India, with 350,000 new cases being confirmed every day and with uh, a total death toll of well over 200,000. Actually, that's not quite as impressive as, uh, as it sounds, given a population of 1.3 billion and I, I think a normal annual death toll of perhaps 10 to 12 million a year. But very few journalists have done a basic course in statistics, and uh, it's certainly a lot of bodies, to paraphrase uh, Boris Johnson, piling up in the streets. And it's not just India. Latin America is also seeing a virulent third or even fourth wave, and God only knows what's going on in countries uh, in Africa, particularly, I guess, in Nigeria. On the other hand, however, for most of the advanced countries, the pandemic is now just about over. If not scientifically, I know that yesterday's New York Times, for instance, led with a story that uh, uh, the continuing virus mutations means that we will never, never reach herd immunity. At, at least politically, it's over. That is particularly true, I think, in the US, uh, where restaurants are now open, where sports events now have are back with huge crowds. And... Uh, the idea that we'll all be stuffed back into our COVID boxes is almost inconceivable. Now, I'm a bit less certain uh, about the future in Europe uh, and even 
in the UK, we tend to be on this side of the channel a little bit more willing to bow to authority and to, as voters were a little bit more passive. But it does seem as though politicians have finally come round to a view which I wish they'd endorsed six months ago, that we will have to learn to live with the COVID virus, even if, as I fear is inevitable, there's a fifth a sixth or even a seventh wave. So in my opinion, that's a real change, though uh, we'll have to ensure that we do learn to live with it. Uh, and certainly living with it may be a different world from one which we would like. I think watch Israel as a pointer for how they come out of this crisis. As for the global economy, well, you probably saw an FT headline last week that the US, uh, that, that while the US is barreling ahead, the EU is back in a double dip recession with the UK languishing somewhere in between. That's certainly what first quarter GDP data would seem to have shown. In the US, for instance, it was report, uh, reported last week that GDP grew in the first quarter at an annual rate of 6.4%, up from 4.3% in the final quarter of last year. That sounds a bit less, a bit more impressive than it would if you just simply look at quarter on quarter data, uh, with the economy being up just 1.6%, but it is still pretty damn good. Plus, it was also reported last week that first-time jobless claims in the US were at their lowest level since the pandemic began, that the conference board's uh, consumer confidence index, which is closely watched by the markets, jumped from 109 to almost 122 last month, and that durable goods orders X transportation, which is the version that tends to be watched most closely, were up 1.6% in March after falling 0.3% in February. And even more impressive, personal income was up an astonishing 21% in March with personal spending up 4.2% thanks to those stimulus checks. All very encouraging. Plus, US house prices were at a 15-year high and pending home sales rose 1.9% last month. That certainly suggests that the US economy is going like gangbusters. Yeah, what about Europe? Well, as the FT's headline suggested, the headline numbers over here were a bit different. For the Eurozone as a whole, for instance, it was reported that GDP fell 0.6% in the first quarter or by 1.6% year on year. It wasn't entirely bad news. And in France, for instance, GDP was up 0.4% for the first quarter. But in Italy, it was down 0.4%. In Spain, it was off 0.5%. In Portugal, GDP was down 3.3%. And most significant of all, German GDP was down 1.7% thanks to a drop in household consumption. Hence the talk of a double dip recession. There's no getting around that. However, it's as well to remember that the first quarter finished more than a month ago. And in any case, the first estimate of quarterly growth is always backloaded to the beginning of the period. More recent data is nothing like as dreary. In particular, it was also reported last week that at the Eurozone level, the consumer confidence index rose from minus 10.8 to minus 8.1, still low, but in April, that the economic sentiment index rose from 100.9 to 110.3, that the industrial sentiment index jumped from 2.1 to 10.7, and that the service sentiment index rose from minus 9.6 to plus 2.1, all for April, which is pretty damn impressive, I would say. Plus, at the member state level, it was also reported that in Germany, IFO, that's the IFO's uh, business climate index for April, hit its highest level since June 2019, while retail sales, and this was a stunner, retail sales were up 7.7%, admittedly in March, but the carryover into April is important. That in France, ANSE's uh, consumer confidence index held at a surprisingly high uh, 94 level in April, and that in, in, in Italy, 
as ISTAT's Consumer Confidence Index uh, rose from 100.9 to 102.3 in April, while the Business Confidence Index jumped quite sharply from just under 102 to 105.4. Finally, that in Spain, even in Spain, business confidence was also up sharply in April. I don't want to over egg the, uh, the Pudding, but there's plenty of evidence that there has been an acceleration in the EU economy over the last couple of months that hasn't been caught in the first quarter GDP statistics. True, Europe continues to lag the US, but both are generally heading in the same direction. What about here in the UK? Well, for those hardy souls who can lift their eyes from the juicy revelations about Carrie Antoinette and her taste in wallpaper, it was also reported last week that uh, household wealth in the, in the UK is now at an all-time high. Plus, the CBI's distributive trade survey, which is important as a measure of retail activity, jumped last month very sharply from minus 45 to plus 20. And in my opinion, rather less encouraging house prices, house prices, damn it, were up another 2.1% or by 7.1% year on year, up from 5.7% in March. In other words, they're still accelerating. Well, I blame Rishi Sunak's ill-considered extension of the stamp duty holiday for that, but I guess I can see why the Tory party strategist probably thought that a housing bubble was a, a good idea politically. Um, we don't have first quarter growth data here in the UK, but uh, I should remind you that growth in February, and we're one of the few countries that calculates GDP growth on a month to month basis was up 0.4%. So somewhere a reach around 1.0 1 to 1.2% for the quarter sounds right to me. What's not to like about that? Well, the short answer, in my opinion, is nothing. What I don't like, however, is that governments on both sides of the Atlantic are now busy pouring gasoline on the fire. Um, that's particularly the case in the US, where last week uh, we saw the launch of President Biden's latest spending plan, his $1.8 trillion American families plan, the AFP, which includes $225 billion for childcare, $225 billion for family and medical leave programs, $200 billion for universal free pre-kindergarten education, and $109 billion for two years free tuition at community colleges across America. Hmm. This is manna for the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, and it reinforces the general conviction that this is the most radical American administration since the days of FDR. I don't know who's running it. I remain skeptical that Biden himself is in charge of policy, but he's too vain a politician to be not to be thrilled to bits by the accolades that he's getting in the media. The New York Times, for instance, calls his program breathtaking. And it is whether or not one thinks that a vast expansion of the government's role in the economy is a good thing. For what it's worth, the American Families Plan will, if it's passed, and uh, there's certainly a lot of momentum going for it in Congress, it will bring the total fiscal stimulus that the Trump and Biden administrations have brought to bear on the pandemic to a total of $9.2 trillion. Wow. Yes, uh, unlike, for instance, Trump's CARES Act a year or so ago. This is supposed to be fully paid for, but I fear that the urge to spend uh, is a lot more powerful on both sides of the aisle in Congress than the urge to tax. And I also note that uh, Biden pledged last week that, and I quote, I will not add to the tax burden of the middle classes of this country, by which Astonishingly enough, he appears to mean anyone who earns less than $400,000 a year. That's kind of an upper middle class to me, but that's what he said. Hence, he intends to fund the $1.8 trillion program by raising the income tax rate from 37% to 39.6% on those earning more than $400,000 a year, and by a near 
doubling of the capital gains tax on those earning more than $1 million a year. Uh, and also by eliminating the so-called carried interest dis deduction. Good luck, good luck. Even if he could actually do that, and some people are going to lobby very hard against it, the chances are that it will bring in any chances that it will bring in anything like what he claims are, in my opinion, slim to zero. But the press is in the tank for Biden, so you don't hear any criticism of the numbers yet. More surprisingly, you don't hear any criticism from the Fed either. Indeed, the FOMC, which met last week to hold US interest rates steady yet again, continues to be supportive uh, and to put, it, uh, to put jobs ahead of pretty much any other goal. I can see the, the political and social pressures on that, but I do think that the overwhelming body of evidence is now that the US economy does not need this kind of fiscal boost and that we will all pay when inflation picks up, when interest rates are forced to rise, when, as Warren Buffett used to say about swimming costumes, we will then see who took on too much cheap debt during the crisis and when the equity bubble bursts. I, I know that until now, evidence of an upsurge in inflation in the US is, is limited, but it's starting, it's starting to come through. Uh, lumber prices, for instance, which are very, very important in the housing industry, are now up 40% year on year. Copper, copper prices rose 11% last month and 94% year on year. And iron ore, prices are up 130% year on year. It may take a while, but all of that is going to show up in the consumer price index, as sure as eggs is eggs. What about Europe? Are our American friends also spending like there's no tomorrow? Well, the will to do so is certainly there. Last week was the deadline for EU member states to submit their plans for how they intend to spend their share of the $750 billion recovery funds that has already been approved, uh, at least in principle. Um, the problem is that it hasn't been approved yet in practice. However, it finally looks as though it's getting off the ground uh, after the German Constitutional Court Count, what's the word, uh, capitulated and withdrew its objections to the fund, at least for now. But the Commission still has to raise the money in the markets, and that could take some time. Even so, just the, it does look to me that just about the time when European recovery will be picking up quite nicely, the Commission will throw another $750 billion uh, onto the fire, which should be enough to get the inflationary pressures building again and the Germans raging about a so-called transfer union. Still, it will almost certainly happen. What does all this mean? Well, in the short term, I guess, it means that the bull market in equities should continue. Last week, the Dow Jones was down 0.5%, the FTSE was up 0.5%, and most other markets were somewhere in between. Uh, yesterday, however, the Dow recouped all of last week's losses and then some. Year to date, it's now up. This is the Dow. The Dow is up year to date 11.5% or 44% year on year. Our own FTSE has done less well. It's only up 7.4% year to date but it's up 21% year on year. As for the German DAX, it's up 11.1% year to date and 46% year on year. This is a bubble and it will burst, but as Keynes is reputed to have said, the markets can stay rational longer than you or I can stay solvent. And there are always good reasons for optimism, certainly quarterly earnings in the US were particularly strong and even better for tech and financials, but it's crazy. I noted yesterday that the MSCI USA index uh, of American equities is now up 641% since the great financial crisis. Part of that's obviously due to a genuine shortage of stocks as previously listed firms have gone private, but most of it 
is simply a product of the huge amounts of liquidity in the system, coupled with a search for yield at a time when interest rates are at historically low levels. What else? Well, looking back at my notes over the last week, a few things stand out. One is another decision from the German Constitutional Court in Karlsruhe. It decided last week that the Merkel government's plans for carbon neutrality by 2050 are unlawful, not because the plan itself is unlawful, but because it is backloaded so that the bulk of the burden will fall after 2030. In the court's opinion, that is an unfair burden on the younger generation, which will be faced with radical uh, measures that they were never able to vote for. As a result, the government now has to rewrite the law so that the burden of its adjustment program falls more equitably on the present generation of voters. Interesting. Speaking of Germany, another little thing that came up last week was that a sharp a snap poll after the Greens had uh, adopted Annalena uh, Bayerbock as their chancellor candidate, has her leading the CDU-CSU's candidate, Armin Lachey, 28 to 21%. That doesn't mean uh, that either that she will be Merkel's successor as chancellor or even that the Greens will lead a hard left coalition government. But, but I think that's a pretty good bet now. The days of Thatcherism and Reaganism and of limited government are well and truly over. I haven't mentioned China yet, and which is pretty unusual these days. Uh, there, I think the big story of the week was the probably the regulatory crackdown on big tech, not just on Ant Group, uh, though Jack Ma's fall from grace has been spectacular. The leaders of 13 fintechs, including Tencent and ByteDance, were hauled before the regulators last week and had their wings severely clipped. No more pell-mell expansion. Get approval from the regulators and from the Communist Party first. I guess I should probably finish with a reference to something I witted on about week after week last year, uh, and certainly before the last election, that Donald Trump's legal problems will follow him from the White House wherever he goes. Actually, we haven't heard a great deal about the cases in New York, and New, both New York City and New York State, that the Attorney General Letitia James and the Manhattan DA Cy Vance Jr. are pursuing, but they haven't let go. Uh, now we have the spectacle of the FBI uh, effecting a dawn raid on the home of former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani and seizing his laptop and his, uh, his computer files, but, but leaving aside very specifically um, the opportunity to take files away that Giuliani insisted actually incriminated Hunter Biden. Uh, they don't want those ones. Instead, uh, the focus is apparently still on Russian influence in the election on behalf of Trump. We will see where that goes. It's all a bit murky, but no doubt more will be revealed. I don't like either Giuliani or Dershowitz, but I notice that Rudy has now retained Alan Dershowitz as his lawyer. That should be fun. As for this week, well, it's uh, Bibi Netanyahu's last chance to form a coalition government in, in, in Israel. Uh, otherwise, I fear the country is heading towards yet another election, which will probably be as indecisive as the last four. As far as economic releases are concerned, the main ones to look forward to are the final PMI, some of which came out yesterday, supporting the idea that uh, the double dip recession is a uh, is over in Europe, um, and uh, non-farm payrolls in the United States. They're always a very big uh, economic release, the first one for the previous month. Look for payrolls to increase more than 900,000, and for concerns to mount about inflation in the US. Here in the UK, the MPC meets, but I'd be stunned if he'd even thought about an interest rate increase at this stage. Maybe it should but there simply isn't the appetite for it at the moment, not least given the political situation here. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again next week.